Hello, and here we go again for our weekly solo voice ensemble singing jolly. Uh, if you're serious about your ensemble singing, did you know there's a master's you can do in it? We do one here at the University of York. Do look it up. It's awfully good. This week, two little pieces from you from 16th century Italy. Uh, one from Venice and one from Modena. One from 1585 and one Modena. Both pieces are related to the Commedia dell'arte, the 16th century tradition of highly skilled improvised comedy based on Greek and Roman models, uh, and which flourished for 200 years from about 1550, especially in Venice. <laughs> Commedia was found at all levels, from performances on trestle tables in town squares to the palaces of princes. Monteverdi himself had dealings with the group in the 1620s. Uh, the best groups were hard to come by and the style spread to France and to Spain and even to the utter cultural backwater of England, where we managed to reduce this distilled, highly improvised cultural comedy down to Mr. Punch wife-beating through the medium of someone hiding in a box and putting his hand up a glove puppet's bum. Comedia had its influence on Shakespeare, and there is in fact a record of a group coming to London as early as 1566. Only one of our two short pieces today is actually comic. The other is from a comedy, but it's a lament in the style of the late 16th century madrigal, a beautiful piece by Orazio Vecchi from his magical comedy or Commedia Armonica, Lamfi Parnasso, which was written for the Modernese court and published in 1597. Let Simon Callow set the scene in Timothy Knappman's words for Ifagellini's DVD recording back in 2003. Without the brush of a Picasso, it's hard to paint Lamfi Parnasso, though as its title clearly speaks, the piece intends to scale twin peaks of music, yes, and comic verse, and through them, at their best, rehearse the themes of love in timeless song, though we won't go on too long. In Vecchi's own prologue to the publication, he says that this is a comedy for the ear and not the eye. He didn't envisage it being staged. But if, with Vecchi, you've concurred that this should not be seen but heard, then don't despair. They do sing prettily. To shut your eyes and think of Italy. In its 14 scenes, Lampi Parnasso is not an improvised piece of Commedia dell'arte. It can't be because the music has to be written down. It's Commedia dell'arte seen through the prism of a vocal ensemble. But the excellent thing about it is the balance between the comic scenes and these serious madrigals. Each one sets the other off. Lampi Parnasso, the twin peaks of Parnassus. Commedia dell'arte characters are either of the earth or of the air. The earth ones are grotesque old men scrabbling around for power and influence, or servants always desperately hungry. Old man Pantalone is said to embody the movement of a chicken or a turkey. Zanni, the porter, is always hungry. The lovers are air characters, looking out and up, almost as in love with the idea of love itself. They didn't wear masks, simply put on makeup and swooned. Our lament today is a soliloquy by the lover Lucio, who has lost his lover Isabella, a name popular for the female lover character due to the actress Isabella Andreini, who was one of the first female superstars of Commedia. Because he's lost her, Lucio plans to throw himself off a cliff, or in this original woodcut from Lampi Parnasso Mora, small lump of earth, actually. Vecchi's music for this scene is an expressive and harmonically rich late Italian magical from the zenith of the period. French viewers, please now say the word zenith. No, I'm afraid not, but thank you for playing. See how the first phrase opens with a harmonic shift up a third. It's tertiary shift. All the audience, folks. Okay, here we go. Our next question for a very lovely contestant here. What harmonic progression 
shifts up or down a third, with one note common to both chords. Uh, Four and Dominant seventh? Is the wrong answer! <laughs> The correct answer is tertiary shift. Please make it stop. On top of this tertiary shift to another major chord, see what gets added over the top, a minor third. We had this major minor chord thing with the Monteverdi last week, and we ended up having to call the music effect a hotline. It's B natural and it works with, not against the B flat in the alto above, precisely because both notes appear at the same time, matching their layout in the harmonic series. The dissonance is acoustically pure and thus embodies pleasure, you imbecile. It's the same idea here. And we're back to the fact that something apparently dissonant can still sound good because the two dissonant notes have a simple mathematical relationship to each other. The top note of an octave has twice the number of vibrations of the bottom one. 220 vibrations a second, 110. If you add the same number again, you get a perfect fifth. And then on to the next octave, add the same number again, you get that major third and so on with the intervals getting smaller and smaller until eventually you get a minor third above the octave. But it still sounds nice above that major third, which is why in jazz and Renaissance music you get them put in that order to create an apparently dissonant but still nice sounding chord. So it's a naturally occurring phenomenon. Phenomena. Stop that! Silly! So, it sounds nice, but if you swap it around so that the major third is in the top and the minor third is in the bottom, then it really doesn't sound nice. But certain composers such as Gombert and Talis uh, have been known to dabble in this inversion of acoustics. Talis uh, in Onata Lux does exactly that. that one I think you could argue is trying to symbolize the mystery of Christ's body. Another thing I love about the slow madrigals in L'Amphi Parnasso is the way sometimes that phrases get stretched just beyond where you think they're going to go to express yearning. The major minor chord that sets up this passage ought to resolve like this. In fact, it goes on for another bar. Marvellous. And there are other lovely touches. I fin to amor, ah, false love, built on the seventh note of a major scale, with having to put in sharps a very false chord. And at the end, now to the highest peak of that mountain may I go, and all the voices go to their highest note. Let's get straight to it with an introduction from Simon and see you afterwards for the second short piece, also for a fascinating bit of etymology. Come gather round people and nobody scoff. Lucio's romance has entered a trough. Isabella has left him, so please all your hats doff. I must end it all, he says with a cough and looks for a cliff top to toss himself off.
And now for our second little piece. In the 1560s, if you'd taken a little boat across the lagoon out of Venice to the south, you'd have come to the little fishing port of Chioggia. One of its more famous musical sons was Giuseppe Zarellino, author of Harmonic Institutions, much quoted at the time. He became maestro at St Mark's and appointed as a young chorister a boy from Chioggia aged eight, our composer Giovanni Croce, known as Chiozzotto, the little one from Chioggia. Croce worked his way up through the choir's ranks, eventually took holy orders and all the time composing, notably some quite good double choir motets and masses and madrigals and penitential sonnets that were particularly valued in England, once they'd been Englished, of course. Here's a picture of Croce in a cool hat. For much of his life, Croce was in the employ of the Church of Santa Maria Formosa, just round the corner from San Marco. Croce and his colleague Baldassare Donato had rival close harmony groups made up of singers St Mark's that sang at uh, private parties or official celebrations at the Scuole. Uh, this was officially not allowed, which of course just shows us how much it was happening at the time. But it came back to bite Croce in the bum when he applied for the main uh, maestroship at St Mark's in 1603, where one of the procurators, the church administrators, complained against those who hired themselves out to sing in churches and squale and at festive banquets, appearing at the latter singing with wine glass in hand. I mean, this all rings incredibly true, doesn't it? I mean, you can just imagine it happening on the scene in London now or here in York uh, and the church administrator, the procurator called Contarini, uh, was probably very grumpy and he probably looked a little bit like a cross between our base, Charles Gibbs, and an anglerfish. Croce was long remembered in Venice because of a comic collection he published in 1595 called Triaca Musicale, uh, a musical cure-all. Triaca was a popular herbal remedy made from 64 ingredients and it has Arabic roots. This is an image from an 11th century Arabic book called The Maintenance of Health and it shows it being made. And in England the word through French came to be associated with a different sort of English cure-all whereby you put cane sugar as a salve for a wound and that's where we get our English word treacle. Triaca to treacle. Isn't that absolutely brilliant? Anyway, back to our man Croce, he became so connected with the cure through his musical Triaca collection that his portrait with the cool hat hung outside a pharmacy in the parish of Santa Margarita as a shop sign until as late as 1790. Not sure how much it helped as he died from an unidentified infection causing fever and spots. I think I should have a hat. Ah. Croce's previous comic collection was the Mascarati Piacevoli, the comic pieces for giving pleasure from 1590. And my chum Donome Gustafsson has reason to believe that these pieces might have been written for the Knights of St John of Malta, who had premises in the Castello part of the city. She thinks the first performance was Carnival 1585. Carnival is the period between Christmas and Lent. And the word itself, carnevale, may mean farewell to meat, which is what happens during the period of abstinence of Lent. It's also related to the Roman festival of Saturnalia, the upturning of the social order, the whole point of which is to let people arse around for a few days and then to put everything back to the way it always was. Venice reputedly doubled in size during carnival, just like our waistlines during lockdown. Partying and all sorts of musical performances was common uh, and these two collections, Triaca Musicale and Mascarate Piacevole, give a good idea of the sort of music that might have been heard, both still available on our Shandos recording from 2002. You could also go and have a look at it on our brand new website, which we're still not telling anybody about. The particular piece from the collection we'll sing is the Mascarata da Linguazzi, the mask of languages, which might just imply that each of the six lines has a different text but remembering that Venice was the centre of east-west trade and that they regarded everyone as foreigners, well, the bass part in this has a German text and the fifth line down has a sort of text from Bologna, whom they would very definitely regarded as foreign. We can see, looking at the beginning of the score here, that Croce's singing group had a couple of high voices, falsettists, a high tenor, two baritones and a bass, just like the King's singers. We have now changed key. And in the piece, most of the parts have a Commedia dell'arte character assigned to them. So you can imagine Croce's group appearing and staging this as the characters. The top part is marked Dazzane, which implies Zane, 
the perpetually hungry servant with the big nose. He and the second singer, unnamed, are singing to Lessandrina. I think she's up in a nice balcony somewhere and they're talking suggestively about her. Now, as the tenor part book for this collection is in fact lost, Donna Mays had to reconstruct the music for it. And it seems likely that it would have been the character that the upper voices are singing to, Lessandrina, cross-dressing here. We've given her a bit of text, having a stab at Vienne sous sous le balcon et alça le tendon, which is Old Venetian for come up to my balcony and part my curtains, which is about the right level for a commedia song. The third part down is sung by Il Magnifico, the Pantalone-esque figure, the old man with the power, uh, nonetheless ridiculous, imagine Basil Fawlty, who is here telling Zanni, with the big nose, to get lost. And you can pronounce that nason that he has um, really quite French. That seems to have been a Venetian thing at the time. The bass is a German, generally caricatured as in search for a drink, here looking for work as well. And in the middle section, he makes the noise of the percussion in a brass band, rather like Gert Frober in those magnificent men in their flying machines. <laughs> Finally, the fifth line is the doctor, Dottore Graziano, the doctor from Bologna, who may not in fact have studied at the university there at all. His characteristic mask uh, would have shown much more of the actor's actual face than most of the other comedia masks. It was also the hardest one to make. Look at this thin little bit across the top there, always the weakest point. Look at these wonderful eyebrows as well. Marvellous. Uh, Graziano tends to talk non-stop about anything in particular, uh, and he frequently gets his words confused. I myself often use the wrong worms, and that is why I was erected charming of the society. <laughs> his catchphrase is Bondi, good day, and that's pretty much all he says in this piece. Bondi? So the group struts around, singing their lines. <laughs> Then there's a short runda section. <laughs> then we get to the Gert Frober section where he's doing the oof, oof sounds while the top four voices make chicken noises. Uh, Dr. Graziano is not that bright as we've mentioned, uh, hasn't noticed that the others have gone into three, so he carries on in two. Then two short sections, uh, the second of which spoofs the emotionally overwrought language of the Italian madrigal. Benemil tu mai lasciato. Ah, my love, you've left me all sad. Don't leave me alone to languish. Before popping back to the beginning to reprise the opening section. Right, that's it. Uh, usual parish notices. Please pay a little something for these shows if you can. Just pop across to ifagellini.com. Um, you can leave a single donation there. Uh, do also subscribe by pressing that little button down there. Thank you. Uh, now put on your carnival mask or your hat, whichever you like, uh, choose your character or voice, and here's Greg Skidmore with the warning. And for fans of Greg, there'll be an in-depth interview with him next week. Okay dudes, don't worry if you can't keep up with this one. It goes along at a bit of a rate. Maybe just sit back and imagine people like Matthew Brooke playing the Doctor in Part 5, and the fabulous James Gilchrist reduced to having to sing in a really wiry voice, Get Lost with That Big Nose. This is what happens when you sign up to sing with Robert. Ich <laughs> bin
Rundar, 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 rundar